All right. So uh, thank you, and I'm really uh, glad to be hosted by Maza Pesha from Tel Aviv Municipality, and we're glad that Tel Aviv International Salon, this organization, has worked with us on all the event rights, infrastructure, and so on. So uh, I'm going to quickly introduce Les Rong. I'm Joshua Fox, Joshua folks, I'm going to really quickly introduce Les Rong, and then I'm going to introduce our honored speaker. So Les Rong is a group, a worldwide group of aspiring rationalists. And what does that mean? Well, what it really means is that we're interested in a set of topics that the most people think are weird, so do we. We just, something in our brains attracts us to these topics. And that includes trying to get things done, get your goals done. Most people don't really try. It includes event preventing the destruction of the human race, particularly from artificial superintelligence. It includes a factor of altruism. That means that if you, I don't know, but if you like helping other people, help other people and don't just feel fuzzy about it. Feeling fuzzy is great. Help other people. That's called being effective as an altruist. And we just have fun. We just have fun together. We talk about things like decision theory, reflective decision theory, quantum mechanics, and the multi-world interpretation. And that's what we consider a party. So uh, we are reaching out to this audience because there's probably a small group of people in the population who switch on when they see this stuff. So please uh, join us, lectures once a month, game nights once a month, two weeks, two weeks between, and on Facebook if you need to track us down, of course there's Less Strong Israel. And now I'd like to uh, introduce our honored speaker. Uh, Zeke Hellman is an old friend of mine. We work together at a high-tech startup. And uh, I, I was really impressed at the way Zeev uh, went back to graduate school. He had earlier gotten his degree at Princeton, and now he went back to graduate school to uh, Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, and got his PhD in areas of game theory, decision theory, and areas of rationality that are actually very close to the things that we're fascinated with. And he jumped right into a tenure track position. Wow. Bar Ilan University. I'm really, really impressed. So uh, it's really my honor to introduce my friend, uh, Dr. Z. Hellman. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you for the uh, all the warm speakers. And good evening, Tel Aviv. Um, so just before I start, I want to mention that I have got co-authors on this research. It is it is a scientific research project, right? Not uh, not just something that's scribbled down one day. On a piece of paper, uh, so I'll mention Omar E. Dunn and Dana Cheryl Moffet, who are my co authors. They really do need to get a uh, credit. Um, and Joshua already introduced me, so we'll go straight to, to the question. And the question before us today is why sex? Okay, now, sometimes over the past uh, several months, when people would ask me, What are you researching? and I'd say, Why sex? they look at me and say, Well, if you don't know why, there's something that may be wrong with you. But uh, no, it, it's actually a very serious question from the point of view of evolutionary biology, which is what we're looking at here and now, okay? So, and I don't just mean human sexuality at all. It's much, much broader than that, because it turns out that the bears also do it, believe it or not, in the woods. Um, and the birds and the bees also do it, as hard as it is to, to believe that. Um, and even in the plant world, yes, there is plant sex. And this male and female goes on just the way it does in other branches of the, uh, the biological world. I don't know if they take pleasure in it. I haven't, you know, inter interviewed any plants about it, but it, it, it does. It does go on. Okay. So the question is, why? Because sex is a very evolutionarily expensive way of re reproducing, okay? and we've got a long list of reasons why it might not pay off from the evolutionary perspective to reproduce sexually. Okay? Costs a lot to look for a mate. And I'm sure a lot of people here know how difficult it is to find an appropriate mate. Uh, it takes a lot of energy, which could be better spent on other things. Right? And then you've got to coordinate between the sexes. And I, again, I don't need to tell you about sometimes different sexes might not be completely coordinated in all sorts of details along the way. Um, and when you go out and look for the mate, you could be uh, in great danger of being. Uh, you know, eaten by a predator and all sorts of things like that. Think about animals that live out in the big ocean and there's miles and kilometers that separate each other. They've got to swim and find each other. Um, right? Think of the salmon spawning upriver and there's actually bears that, that open their mouths and eat the salmon as they're on their way to, to reproduce. It's an amazing sight. Um, but what we're going to focus on today is 
what to me is the most fundamental cost that seems to occur in sexual reproduction, and that's the random shuffling between generations, right? So you take a female who has proven that she's got the genetic composition to survive from childhood and adolescence, you know, she gets to adulthood, she's got all the right genes, right? Then you've got a male who's the same, he's made it to adulthood, he's proven he's got <coughs> the right gene combination. You take the two of them together, and you just play lottery with the, the gene. Let's see what happens in terms of the, the offspring that come out. Uh, genetically, it seems completely random. It is random, and uh, it seems to make no sense when you first think about it. Right? So that's why I underlined it. The prominence of randomness here appears especially surprising. Why, why go for them? Okay? It seems that asexual reproduction, by which I mean you simply you, know, you get to the age 18 or whatever it is, split into two. You know? It's like the bacteria and, and so forth. Uh, just clone yourself. That would seem to be much more efficient for a large number of reasons, and that's why the question is, why sex? Um, and in fact, this is one of the most vexing open problems in the study of evolutionary biology, and to the point that it's even been termed a paradox that 90-something percent of species on Earth reproduce sexually, not asexually. It's considered a big open question in, uh, in the study of, of uh, biology and human evolution. Okay? Now... As Joshua said, uh, my speciality is game theory. Right? I'm not going to go into all the details of what that means. But one of the things I did learn from my teachers is that whenever you approach a question, you need to ask, who is the player? Right? Who is the main actor, the, the actor who's taking decisions or taking actions? Okay? Now, in this case, it's not the species. Right? It's not the species that reproduces. It's the individuals. In fact, it's not the organism. Because if you think about what happens with the organism under sexual reproduction is, the organism has offspring who are different genetically from the parent. So it's not the organism that's the actor, it's not the organism that's reproducing, strictly speaking. Okay? Now, we've all, or maybe most of us have read the books by uh, the uh, Dawkins, Richard Dawkins from Oxford, so we all know that the selfish gene should be the right answer, right? But even that's not true. Because no gene operates alone. The ensembles of the genes is how the genes work together to produce the organism. Okay, so it's even not clear exactly who the relevant player is that we should focus on in approaching this question. Right? What we need to think about is to consider how teams of genes are formed and how they, they work together. Right? Here's a photograph uh, from, I think it's one of the Oxford races, uh, uh, which was actually used by Dawkins in, in his book as a metaphor. Right? What nature needs to do it's just like we need to put, we want to put together the right combination of rowers, you know, the heavy ones, the lighter ones, the stronger ones, etc. When you're approaching a race, the same thing is true in nature. You want to get that right combination of genes that will do the best work together. Okay, so, I'll have to give you just a wee bit uh, background on population genetics terms. Uh, we'll get to the equations later, just now we need to get the terms down. So, just bear with me as we go through some of this. Okay, what's a gene? Right, you've, you've heard that term. So strictly speaking, a gene is a segment of DNA that codes for a protein that expresses a trait. Okay? So you can imagine that uh, this is the DNA. Okay? A locus on the chromosome is a specific location that contains a gene. So if we take a look here, we've got so, sort of two uh, genotypes, let's call them that, right? Um, and we can actually label and number the positions on the DNA string. And there'll be one position, let's say here, that determines the color of the flowers. So that'll be the gene. The gene for flowers will be here. And there'll be a locus, that's the location on the genotype where that coding is done. Okay? Um, and so the locus, there'll be a locus for, for the flower colored gene. That's how we call it. Okay? Now, there may be variants, right? Some of us have dark hair and some of us have blonde hair. And some of us have blue eyes and some of us have brown eyes. So we're all familiar with the idea that there are variants of genes that, you know, different ones. Each of us may have different variants and express different traits that way. Okay? So those are called alleles. That's what they're called in the, in the scientific literature. An allele is, is a variant of a gene. Okay? And each allele will express a different variant of a trait. So, for example, there'll be an allele for black fur and an allele for white fur. And there'll be an allele for purple flowers and yellow flowers, and so forth and so on. 
So I hope I haven't gone through this too fast and you've at least got some of these terms down because they're going to be important in, in uh, the rest of the talk. Okay? Now, what happens is that um, we can think of it, I, I like the metaphor of a menu, right? You go into a restaurant and you've got the you know, first course and the second course and you pick one item for each. And the same thing is really what's happening in the genotypes and the DNAs we've got, right? So let's say we've got a creature that has four traits. Yeah. Eye color, it's got a blood type, it's got wings, and it's got a tail. Now for eye color, it could be brown, blue, green, or red, right? Its blood type could be A, B, and O, etc., etc., right? So these are all the possible ways that we could form our organism using these four traits, right? And what, what happens is, in each organism, is we pick one trait from each column in the menu, right? So we might have a creature that's got red eyes and O blood type, and it's got long wings and a straight tail, you know, which could be a wonderful dragon if you think about it, um, right? So that creature is born with the, its particular genotype, and you know it's got you know each locus in that genotype one the, the gene for expressing one of these traits is located within that organism, right? And we can imagine you know. An organism that's got blue eyes and A blood type and so forth and so on. We can imagine taking one choice from each column and putting together our creatures. Okay? Um, and that string, that string of the traits we've chosen, one from each column, that's what we call the genotype of the creature. Right? And so each of us, if you think about it, is born with our DNA string, and each of us has you know, a trait that's being selected for us, as it were, and that's what determines our eye color and hair color all sorts of other things, okay? Simplifying just a bit, but this really is what's going on. Um, we can think of it more abstractly, it's just a string of letters that we've chosen, one from each column, and we put it together, um, okay? And now we might be able to think of the collection of all the possible genotypes, right? So think about every single combination. I take this and that, and one from here, one from there. I can think of all the possible matchings, of combinations, all the possible choices of the first course, second course, third course, etc. And then I get a set, right? So if you look in this room, each of us bears a different genotype from the set of all possible human genotypes that one could imagine, that could be created, right? So we're going to consider the set of all the possible uh, genotype, uh, all the possible genetic combinations, we'll, and we'll call that gamma, that'll be a big set that we're looking at as we're approaching the question. Okay, so, what's going on? Every creature is born with a particular genotype, G. Right? Here's our creature. Sorry. Right? And that creature has one mission in life, from the evolutionary perspective. <laughs> the one thing that that creature has to do is to produce offspring. Right? That's it. Okay? But, we haven't talked about uh, survival of the fittest yet, or about selection. So, what is selection? In the model I'm going to use, not every creature survives to, repro to reproduce. Not every creature makes it through childhood or through adolescence or finds a mate, etc. Okay? So, the probability of our creature with that genotype G to get to the point of mating and reproducing depends on the genotype. You can imagine the creature is born with a gene that means that its liver doesn't work properly. Very sad. And that creature then dies at the age of three or whatever it is, doesn't get to adulthood, doesn't reproduce. Okay? And if it's got bad legs, then it's not going to be able to run away from a predator that comes to eat it and it'll get eaten. Um, so there's a certain probability that each creature has for surviving and reproducing, which depends to a great extent on the genotype that creature was born with. Um, uh, in in uh, nature, this is really a very serious issue. I think I heard on some nature program, uh, probably with uh, Dave Attenborough or something on television, that uh, a polar bear born in the, in the North Pole, you know, a cub, a cub that's just been born, has about only a 25% chance of surviving to, to reproduce, okay? only one out of four. So um, nature, red in tooth and claw and all that, uh, makes this a very serious issue. Okay? So a bit more formally. What? So global warming can't make things much worse. Yeah, sure, it can reduce the probability. <laughs> it can make it go down to 25%. <laughs> okay. Sorry. 
I took that question too seriously. Um, <laughs> okay, so more formally, we'll, we'll let V, right, V of G, so that will, will stand for the probability that a creature with genotype G survives to reproductive maturity. So then does that depend on the, the other the set of other genotypes? In, the, uh, in my model, it'll depend only on the genotype it's got and on the environment. Right? So if I stick you know, the polar bear in Africa, it might have different chances of surviving than in its natural habitat. But it doesn't depend on the other bears. It doesn't depend on the other bears in this model. That's good. Um, it's a simple model. Maybe later on we can have interactions with people. A good question. Okay? So, right, we talk about survival of the fittest, right? I'm going to define fitness and viability, which is a term I prefer for this model, to be exactly that probability. That probability of the creature being born with that genotype surviving in the environment in which it finds itself. Okay? So the fit survive with high probability, the unfit do not survive with high probability, they've got a low probability of surviving, and that in turn affects the mix of genotypes in the next generation. It's you know, basically Darwinism here on al uh, al Khat on one foot. That's, that's Darwinism. Boiled down to its the essence. Okay, so we, we can think of evolution sort of as, as a walk through genotype space, right? So genotype space, we can think of that space of all the possible combinations. But as we go forward in time, we don't see all the possible combinations because some combinations die out. Okay, so as we move forward in time, we see different sort of compositions, different makes of, makes of genotypes. Some genotypes will see more often than others because they don't make it, the, the bad ones don't make it through the sieve of selection. So evolution in a way, you know, if you ask what is evolution, it's exactly the study of how that composition of genotypes changes over time as the environment changes as things happen to the creatures. This is a Again, boiling everything down to its essence. What's Darwinism? It's that probability of survival. What's evolution? It's how the genotypes, or the composition of the genotypes in the population changes over time as things happen and events unfold. All right? So, again, this is supposed to be a lecture on sex versus asex. Right? That was the whole point. So let's start with asexual reproduction. Let's hope that the multimedia works. I haven't tried this yet uh, in front of a crowd. Bacteria reproduce very simply and rapidly by doubling their contents and splitting in two. Just one bacterium, dividing every 20 minutes, could produce nearly 5,000 billion billion bacteria in one day. Okay, so that's asexual reproduction right there. Right? Basically, split in two, you clone, you make an exact copy of each individual, and that's how the population grows. That's that's what I mean by asexual reproduction. Oops. Lost focus. Right. Okay, so let's consider what happens under asexual reproduction so we can compare it to sexual reproduction. So let's suppose we've got a population of two types of bacteria. Right? We'll have the green bacteria and the red bacteria. Right? Two, two different subpopulations of bacteria. And they're both reproducing asexually because they're bacteria. So right, once a bacterium has lived long enough, it just splits into two copies. All right? So let's say uh, you know, we've got uh, genotype G1 and G2. So G1 might be the green one, G2 will be the red one, let's say. Um, and these populations are competing with each other. Who's going to have a bigger share of the population as time goes on? That's what happens in nature, this competition between the different populations. All right? Now, I said, there's a viability, there's a probability to survive. So, let's say you've got that green bacteria genotype, G1 here, as I called it, um, and suppose that means you've got a 70% chance of surviving and splitting and reproducing asexually. <coughs> that's for the green population. And let's say for the red population, you've got G2, that's red, so you've got only a 60% chance of surviving. Right? Because they've got the genotypes. And suppose that we've got an initial population at time t equals 1, we've got 50 green and 50 red. Right? So half the population is green, and half the population is red. Um, and we've got sort of an average viability, that's the average of these two, 70%, 60%, and you get 65% is the average. That's what we're starting out with. Equal percentages of the red and green, 
And we can talk about the average viability, the average fitness in the population, which in this case, the way I've set it up, is 65%. Right? So, we run time forward. Now it's time t equals 2. Remember we said that a green bacteria is more likely to survive than a red bacteria. So in the next generation, we're going to see more of the green ones and less of the red ones, simply because of the way the probabilities work out, right? Okay? So now we expect at time t equals 2 that there will be 70 green ones and only 60 red ones. So, remember, we started out 50-50. It was half and half in terms of the population makeup. But now in the next generation, there are more greens and less reds. So in fractional terms, you can work it out. You've got 7 divided by 13 of the uh, green ones, and the red ones have only 6 out of 13, right? And we can again ask, what is the average viability in this population at time t equals 2? We can work it out. I've done it for you. It turns out to be a, something like uh, 0 0.654, which is bigger than the 6.5 we started out with. So what we see is that the average viability, the average fitness, has gone up from one generation to the next. Okay? Um, and in fact, this goes on in each generation. There's a very precise formula here. It's called the replicator equation. I was told I could put equations up on the slides. So Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'll try and break it down as simply as I can for you. This, you know, PIT plus 1, this is the population fraction that genotype I has at time t plus 1. So what is that fraction? It depends on the fraction that, the, that, that the, this genotype had at time t, right, which is represented here. And that fraction is multiplied by this number. This is the probability of a genotype of I to survive. That's on top here. That's in the numerator. In the denominator, we've got the average in the population. So, what does that mean? If this number, the viability of i divided by the, by the average viability is bigger than 1, then your fraction in the next property, in the next time period is going to increase. If this fraction, your viability divided by the average viability, if that's less than 1, then there's going to be less of you, of your genotypes, in the next generation. Okay? So basically, you've got to be better than average. You've got to beat the market. Right? You've all heard about this in terms of investing. It's exactly the same thing in the biological world. If you're better than average, there'll be more of you. If you're less than, worse than average, there's going to be less of you. Sorry, but it's a typo there in the second uh, Could be. When it's uh, less than the average, so it's supposed to be decreased. Right? Yeah, right. It should be decreasing. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, that's a typo. Okay. Take note for myself. Um, yeah, but so basically, you get the, the basic idea. Either you're better than average and then you increase, or you're less than average and you decrease. So that's, uh, yeah. You assume that uh, each um, individual chooses, like, is capable of choosing, like, the right merit that will enable, enable him or her to, 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 to. Okay, well, this is asexual, so there's no question of mates. So, so far, it's the asexual population. Ah, this is the asexual. This is the, this is the asexual. We'll, we'll talk about the sexual later on. In order to compare the sexual versus the asexual, we need to know what the asexual is, right? So, right? Okay. So, what's happening is, like I said, you've got to be better than average to to get you know a bigger share of the population. But as time goes on, that average is going is rising up. So you've got to keep running faster and faster. Um, and eventually. Eventually, in the limit, as time goes on, the uh, viability of the population is going to equal the viability of the green bacteria. It's going to equal the viability of the optimal, this is the, the greatest growth rate. And in fact, what we're going to see is just about all the population will be that green bacteria, and the red bacteria are going to basically be wiped out eventually. Okay? So, that's what's happening in asexual reproduction. Uh, this is called Fisher's Theorem. Uh, it's named after Fisher, who was a, a, a very important figure, Ronald Fisher, 
uh, back in the 1920s and 1930s. So the average population viability increases monotonically in each generation. So the viability goes up in each generation. We never go down. Fitness always goes up in this model from generation to generation. Eventually, it reaches a maximal value and stops there. Eventually, the only ones left in the population are those who have the maximal viability, the maximal fitness. And that's when evolution sort of stops and we get to an equilibrium. Right? That's called the fundamental theorem of natural selection by Ronald Fisher. No less than the fundamental theorem. Right? This is uh, what uh, a lot of biology is based on. Um, okay, so again, it's a very simple model. It's a race. The race goes to the swift. The ones who have the best fitness are the ones who win. At the end, they take over the population. If you have two situations, one situation where the number of individuals in the population is fixed at you know a thousand or whatever, and another one where it can increase over over time, uh, then does you know at some point it'll be all green? Correct. Right? Does, is that time bigger and? One case and smaller in the other. So, yeah, so you're asking about sort of the asymptotic uh, or, or the the time for to for to fixation. That's, yeah. that's really the way it should be. It should be uh, said. Um, I think there are too many variables here just to, to be able to toss off a, an answer that mm -hmm. quickly. Uh, theoretically, um, it shouldn't make that much of a difference. The question is, what happens when you get to you know, the limits of the population? So you've, you've set some limits. Only a thousand individuals that can live in your little pond, right? Um, so I suppose it would depend on what determines who dies off beyond that cutoff. If that determination is also dependent only on the green versus the red, then it shouldn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. okay? you, should, you should see basically the same fractions going on. But let's, uh, let's go on and we can talk about that later. OK. Um, so, uh, there's someone called uh, Siavash Shashani who showed that this can be interpreted as a gradient hill climbing dynamic. What, what does that mean? Right? We can imagine that this is sort of the viability of the population when we start. And it's always climbing up, right? it's going up, it's sort of like climbing a mountain. Right? So, this represents the average viability of the population. We're monotonically climbing, climbing, climbing until we reach some plateau which is at the maximal level. And you can actually write down the equations and make it look as if you're climbing a hill. Okay? There's another interpretation to this, which is a bit more recent, and it's an algorithm interpretation. And what it's saying is the dynamic here is really a machine learning algorithm. Okay? So, what does machine learning algorithm mean? Machine learning algorithms are algorithms that learn from data on their own without being pre-programmed. Okay? So, we're used to programs which run algorithms. We've got that you know, everywhere now in our uh, computers and our telephones and, and the banks and everything. Most of those, nearly all of them, are programs that a programmer sat and composed, you know, the program. And the programmer tried to think about all the possibilities. You know, you might press the red button or you might press the left button or the up. And the programmer tries to anticipate ahead of time all the possibilities and code into the program What's going on? Right? That's not machine learning. That's coding. Machine learning is the algorithm starts out not knowing anything. It's dumb. And it looks and tries to see what you do. And it tries to learn your behaviors. And it tries over time to learn how to best anticipate what you're doing and to respond optimally. That's machine learning. Right? So the machine is basically it's not being told what to do. It's not being programmed. It's learning what is the optimal. That's basically what machine learning is. Okay, so why do I say that the asexual population reproduction that I just showed you is a form of machine learning? Because there is no way to tell ahead of time which genotype is the better one, out of the red, the red and the green. Okay, it depends on the environment. There could be environments where it's better to be a green bacteria, right? There could be some creature that um, eats the red ones because it likes the red ones, and so. You've got less chance of surviving if you're red. Or the environment could be different. It could be an environment in which you're better off being red. Right? That creature could prefer the greens. You don't know ahead of time which one. There's no way to pre-program it. That's the point. Right? So the asexual reproduction dynamic learns the environment. Right? It doesn't know ahead of time which is better, the green or the red, but it learns over time that the green one is better. 
and then homes in on that optimal viability level. And that's why reproduction is a form of machine learning over time, over generations. Okay? What do you mean by saying environment? The environment is everything that determines whether you'll survive or not. So suppose you're born with a genotype that gives you a lot of fur, but you're in a hot environment because it's global warming. So you're not going to do too well, right? But the opposite, right? It could be that you know we're in some major ice age, and then having fur is a good thing for you, for your genotype. So the environment determines whether the genotype you're born with is good or bad. It determines the probability that you'll survive. Now, there's no way, again, ahead of time to know what the environment's going to be, because that depends on too many external factors. So what evolution does is it learns. It learns the environment over time in this very simple process that we went through. And it's, it's actually a very good machine learning algorithm. It hones in on that optimal value. It finds the optimal value. It does its, does its job quite well. Okay. Um, and you know, it's very simple. You don't need any, anything, any intelligence. It's just run the program, right? It's very reliable. It always gets to that optimal point. It never, never fails. never misses. It's self-sustaining. You don't need to do anything. You just set it. You know, off it runs. It requires no supervisory intelligence. You don't need any intelligence here, no God to tell you what to do. You just set the thing off and running. It doesn't matter what environment it's in. It, what is in, it will find that optimal value. And it actually has a very rapid rate of convergence to optimal value. I'm not going to go into the mathematics, but it's actually a very, very fast algorithm for attaining what it wants to attain. Is there a question? Well, I mean, it, it does get the... The optimal value if the environment doesn't change. Correct. So uh, if there's a change in the environment later and you've made the whole pond green, um, then the whole pond can be wiped out if the alkaline level changes and the red groups survive. That's true. And that's why mutations uh, are part of the story. We're not, we don't have mutations in this story. You're right. Yes? If I can elaborate on what you said, it's actually the, the challenge is turning from writing as a coder, writing the right algorithm to writing the right heuristics for your. Okay, you might want it to call it that, yeah. But what you want is you want your program to be able to do the job without you telling it what to do. You just have to say, you know, start, and it runs. And that's exactly what this does. But still you need some heuristics to determine which one, which one to kill off, or which is, what, what, what is um, suitable means? No, what you, what you, all you need to do is you need to have these creatures reproduce. And that's it. You don't need anything more than that. You don't need to tell it which is better, it learns which is better on its own. So the, the question that you have, like, so like what algorithm like, should find the, this like, gene sequence in the parameter space? Like, right. With the highest viability. Right, we've got the genotype space, we've got all the possible genotypes. One of them, or maybe more, it doesn't matter, but there, you know, there, there is one that, that's the optimal one. And what you want to do is you want to find that. And here you've got an algorithm, it's called asexual reproduction, that does that. It takes it takes time, but it gets there. It gets to the highest peak. It climbs the gradient. It climbs the hill, it climbs the mountain. It gets to that point. Every time. Okay? All right, so that's asexual reproduction. Is there a situation where the two types are more or less the same? It could be. I'm, I'm not denying it. They could be equal, and then they'll half the population will be this and half that, or it could be a third and a third. I'm not worried that out. What? <coughs> The researcher has to know gamma. Well, you gamma is sort of given. You have, you have, you have to know that. Well, I, I'm, I'm describing here something that sort of nature does. Um, now you're well, right. To put it into the machine, you have to know gamma. The machine here is nature. Okay, so you're thinking very clear. I'm thinking more of the slide, I suppose. I'm talking about nature. What nature does? I'm thinking okay. of evolution as nature's machine learning algorithm. Okay. 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 Nature already has all the, the gene sure. possibilities. It goes through them all and sure. finds the optimum. That's what's going on. Okay? So that's asexual reproduction. But we didn't come here to hear about that. We came here to about, hear about sex, didn't we? That was the whole point of <laughs> selling it. So um, let's take a look at what happens under sexual reproduction. Okay? So we assume that each individual in the population mates with another individual, right? So it's not splitting now. Now you've got to find your mate and together you reproduce. 
Okay, we're going to suppose for simplicity for this model, each mating pair conceives some number of offspring, which is given. Okay, so after mating, there's both the adult parent population and the offspring population. This shouldn't surprise anyone. And there's something called death, so you know the parents eventually die off, um, and the children are left. But uh, it's the children who then grow up, and then they become adults, and they are then the adult population at time t plus one. They split off into pairs and mate, and so forth and so on. That's what happens under sexual reproduction, you know, in the most elementary description possible, right? I have a question yeah. about this elementary description. The um, uh, ethos of the human uh, stories tell us about the primal uh, one male and one female, Adam and Eve. And, and letting this aside, I'm asking about in nature, is, 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 does it happen that some population is created by one, two, like one male and one female species? Yeah. Of that species? Founder? I, I imagine that's true, yeah. Yes, this is the base, base, uh, exactly. I, I don't know enough about, you know, the history of uh, evolution to tell you that, but I can imagine it could happen. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. is an effective sea population in humans is about 10,000 or 100,000. What's it? I don't the seed population. Oh, the seed population. Okay, then maybe the people here know a lot more about history of evolution than I do. I'll leave it to them. Right? This is a theoretical model that I'm going through. Right, so I'm starting at time t equals 1. There's some population. It mates, reproduces sexually, so forth and so on. Right? Let's go back to our story then. Okay, so not all of the off offspring who are conceived at time t survive. Right? That's exactly the fitness and viability we were talking about. So, when we look at the adult population at time t plus 1, it's not all the offspring, all the children who were born at time t, because some of them died along the way. That's natural selection. Okay, so, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Each of these creatures, given its genotype, will have a different probability of surviving to adulthood. Okay? Depends very much on the genotype and the environment. Okay, now, what happens in terms of the gene strengths? <coughs> so, suppose this is the mommy and this is the daddy. So the mommy's got her gene string, right? These are all the alleles she's, she's got in her DNA. And this is daddy's genes, right? That's what he's got. And they mate, and they produce the little baby. And the little baby gets genes either from mommy or daddy, and it's sort of like flipping a coin in each location, right? So you flip a coin here, you get at location one, mommy's genes or daddy's allele, I should say, really. So here, I, you know, I suppose they got mommy's allele at the first location. You go to the second location, you get it from mommy or daddy, so here it's daddy, and so forth and so on. So basically, it's a complete lottery. Right? This really goes on, it's, it's random. At each location, you get either from you know, your mother or your father, the gene. Now, this is simplifying because um, we're, we're, we're diploid creatures. We've got you know sort of two copies of each chromosome, and you can get you know two from your father. You can get, or rather, you can get uh, you can get one from your father, one from your mother, and they, they go together. So I'm simplifying the story. I'm assuming there's only sort of one string, but it doesn't really matter for the model I'm making. We'll still get to the same conclusions. It just makes it easier to think of it this way. So I'll just a quick disclaimer. Um, Okay, so before, remember, we kept track of the greens and the reds, right? The green genotypes, the red genotypes. In sexual reproduction, it makes less sense to keep track of the individual genotypes because they get, they get mixed up randomly anyway during reproduction. What we want to keep track of here, really, is the frequency of the alleles, of the individual alleles. So, for example, right, suppose we've got blue eyes and green eyes in the population. What we want to keep track of is what percentage of the, of the population has blue eyes at time t, so that's going to be QBT, versus what percentage of the, of the population has green eyes at time t, so that'll be QGT. And what we're going to do as time moves forward now is we're going to look specifically at how the fraction of the population that has blue eyes changes vis-a-vis -vis the fraction of the population that has green eyes, which might depend on all sorts of factors. And that's what we're looking at when we're studying sexual reproduction as opposed to asexual. Right? Okay, so if we concentrate on one locus in isolation, 
We actually get the same story as we had before. This is a classic story. It's the moths of Manchester. So, so this is yeah. sort of like the contribution of each of the looks is for the viability. It's like it's like you're adding like one. They're not like related. Yeah. You don't like you have, okay. have no yeah. compound. Is that the right? Yeah. So that, that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. Okay. If we assume that the local the genes don't interact, okay, each locus is independent. Then we get exactly the same story as we had before with the A section. Right. So this is a classic story of the moths of Manchester, right? So in the early 19th century, there was a preponderance of white-winged moths in Manchester. This is actually studied as a true fact. And by the end of the 19th century, they were nearly all black. Um, and what happened was that there was an industrial revolution. And uh, that made the sort of background look much darker. So the moths with white wings stood out more, and the birds ate more of them. This is the, the explanation. And so what happens is, you know, the white ones got eaten, and therefore we saw more and more of the black ones. So, if you think about it, you know, if we now, we've got QW is the fraction of moths with white wings, and QB is those with black wings, we have exactly the same story as we had of the bacteria before. Before we had the green and the red bacteria, now we've got the white moths and the black moths, and it's exactly the same, the same story, right? So the frequency of the better allele, that's the one that gives you a greater chance of surviving, that will increase at the expense of the alleles that give you a lower chance of surviving. And if this process really occurred at each locus independently, that will be the end of the story if we have exactly the same story as we had before. But matters are not so simple, and it's exactly a good thing that you ask that question, because what happens is that the loci are not independent. right? They do affect each other. It's called epistasis. So, you know, the, the genes you've got for, for your blood type and the, what you've got for your lungs, you know, because they, you've got, they interact together, um, could have an effect. You, might, you, know, you want to have the right combination of this and that put together in order to survive. You can't just look at each one in isolation, right? So, you know, here's a simple example. Suppose we've got only two loci, like right? one and two, and we've got two alleles, A1 and A2, and B1 and B2. And, you know, here we've got the viabilities. Okay, so, now, is A1 better than A2? Well, um, that depends on whether you've got B1 or B2 with you, right? Because let's take a look here. Um, let's say I've got uh, B1. So, here, if I've got B1 <coughs> with A1 and A2, then if you've got B1, you'd rather have A1, because then you get 0 0.9 as opposed to 0 0.3. But suppose that you're sitting next to a B2 allele. Then A2 is better, because then you get 0 0.8 versus 0 0.5. Okay? Um, and we can go through all the possible combinations, and you see that <coughs> the question is, you know, which allele is better? It doesn't, you, you don't have a simple answer, because it depends on which other alleles are sitting next to you in your genotype. That makes things far more complicated. And in fact, when epistasis is taken into account, when this interaction between the genes is taken into account, Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection fails to hold. Right? The theorem doesn't, doesn't hold water anymore. In fact, the average viability of the population, right before we said it always monotonically increases, it may fall between generations. You could have a generation in which the genes happen to mix in a very bad way, and then the population viability falls. In fact, the average viability may converge to a suboptimal level. You could, over time, end up with a population that's suboptimal, that doesn't hit that maximal genotype, because of the way the genes have been interacting and interfering with each other. Okay? So there's no gradient climb. You're not climbing the mountain anymore. You've got these hills and valleys, and all sorts of things can, can happen along the way. Yes? Uh, philosophically or scientifically, uh, choosing, uh, sh choosing a, a mate Yes. Is part of the selection of the environment or, or, or not? Uh, in, in the model, yeah, that, that's sort of part of the, envi okay. the environment. So your viability is your probability of surviving, finding a mate, and successfully having children. So I, I put all that into the viability. Right. So that, mm -hmm. If you've got a 0.62% chance, that, that includes all those things put together, the one, one number. So that, that's how it works. Okay, so now we want to ask how can we track the dynamics of a population when we've got epistasis 
when we've got all these genes interfering with each other. So, let's consider the viewpoint of just one allele. Just make things simple, right? But the allele of the blue eyes. We've got the allele of the blue eyes, and it wants, as it were, were in inverted commas, it wants to take over the population, wants to spread itself over time in the population. Okay? Now, that allele will appear in each generation in many different individuals with different genotypes. So it will appear in this cat with you know, its stripes, and it will appear in this white furred cat, and in this sort of black furred, furred cat. Right? I know we all want to see pictures of you know, electron sex, but I decided cats would be <laughs> Just the right thing for this sort of audience. Everyone knows that. Um, okay, so again, the allele for blue eyes, it appears in each individual with a different genotype, Right? In, in the same, at, the, at the same time in, in each generation. But each genotype in which it is sitting has a different viability level, has a different probability of survival. Right? So let's say if our blue allele is sitting in this cat with the stripes because it can hide in the grass or whatever, it's got a 95% chance of surviving. The, the one with the, uh, with the uh, white fur, you know, that might be not the thing you want to do because you're easily seen by the predators and the one with the black one is somewhere in between them. Right? So the blue allele is going to have a different survival chance depending on which other genes it's sitting next to, which is exactly what we talked about earlier about the epistasis, about the interactions between the genes. Okay, so we can think of this as if each allele is buying a share in of stock, like on the stock market. Okay? And the payoff of that stock is the number of surviving adults that the genotypes gives. Right? I'll, I'll try to go through this. Slow, right? So, the blue-eyed allele has invested in this genotype, right? in this cat with the, with the stripes, and it got a payoff for its investment. It got you know, three offspring in the next generation who also bear the blue eyes. Right? So that was the payoff it got for investing in that genotype, in that stock. Okay? Because it invested in this one as well, the one with the black fur, it also got a payoff, it got a lower payoff. It only got, so let's say, two offspring in the next generation bearing it. Right? So, in fact, we've got an investment metaphor. The alleles are investing. Each of us is an investment vehicle for all our genes, where the genes are hoping to get a payoff through the offspring that, that will bring into this world. Right? So now the totality of the individual bearing that allele for blue eyes is its portfolio, because that's the portfolio, right? The portfolio is exactly that. You buy stocks in different uh, companies, and then you put together a portfolio. And the yield that you get from the portfolio is the average that you get from all the, all the investments you've made. And that's exactly what's happening in, in nature, is that the genes, right? So let's say the genes for blue eyes will be in a certain number of people in the population. It'll get a differential number of offspring from each one, and the average it gets is the payoff that it got for its investment. I hope this is clear enough. Do you have any questions? <coughs> so let's say that. Yes, is there a question? Um, the result of the portfolio is all the uh, all the descendants that the allele has yeah. times the chance that the allele will pass to the descendants. Right. It's not a hundred percent chance. Correct. So you know if. if if you've got sort of an 80 percent chance here and a 40 percent chance there, then your average is going to be 60 percent because you've got the average there. So you, you end up with the average of the portfolio that you've bought. Right? You see what I'm saying? It's exactly the same as investing in stock. Okay. So alleles at the same locus compete with each other over their portfolio growth. Because right? each allele, you've got the alleles of the blue eyes versus the ones with the brown eyes, each of them have bought sort of a separate portfolio in the population. Each of them gets a certain return for their portfolio investment. And they compete over who is the better investor, who can form a better portfolio over time and then grow over time, right? So the alleles, they cooperate with the genes of other loci, but they compete with each other at each locus, okay? So, what makes an allele do well in competition over the portfolio in this, port in this competition? Good cooperation with the alleles and other loci, right? So, the better the allele interacts with the other genes 
for the other alleles in the other loci, the higher the return will give, and then the higher the portfolio growth. Right? Remember the rose analogy? It's exactly that. You want to get that right mix. You want to sit next to the guy immediately on your, you know, in front of you and behind you who are going to give enough of an oomph to give you a better chance also of doing better in the race. Uh, so, so yeah. in, in this case, the color of the eye and the eye, the level for the color of the eyes, is sitting near the, the genes for, for the color of, uh, right. of, of uh, the skin. Yeah, so you can imagine this guy is the other uh, for eyes, so, and then he's sitting next to something that determines the skin color and something that determines the lung function and something that determines um, you know, the, uh, how strong the legs are when they run, all the, all the possibilities. So. And what you want to do is you want to get a good combination, okay? Because they have to cooperate, they have to work together. Yes, in your model, do, 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 do you? Uh, it is like only all the genes you, you are looking for are dominant. You don't look about. Uh, you don't take into your model like. Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, like, as I said before, I, I'm not assuming that we're we but I'm not, not assuming we've got two copies of each chromosome. It's like a model with one chromosome. So okay. that, that doesn't come up. But you expand it, you can expand this model. You can expand it, yeah. Okay. You can add, add more details, but this is a simpler model. Right? Okay. So, let's look at this a bit, in a bit more detail. We've got allyl I at time t, and this is its portfolio growth. Right? The average portfolio growth in population at time t is this. And QIT will be the fraction of the population bearing allyl I at time t. So, if let's say allyl I is blue, so this will be sort of the portfolio growth of the blue allele at time t. This will be the average portfolio growth of the population. It's all, all the population put together. And this is the percentage of the population that's bearing the blue, the blue allele. Okay, that's what we're doing here. And what are the dynamics? They come out to be this. Okay? It's exactly the same equation we had before. But now it's for the individual alleles in the individual loci. Right? So, again, <coughs> take it slowly. This will be QIT plus 1. This is the um, fraction of the population bearing, say, blue eyes at time t plus 1. QIT will be what it was at time t. This up here is the portfolio return that that allele got, the blue eye gene got at time t. And this is the average in the population. So once again, you've got to beat the average. If your portfolio return is better than the average, there will be more of you meaning you will be gene the allele in the next generation. If this, if you're worse than the average, this will do it be less than one, your frequency will decrease. Okay? And this does hold true separately and independently at each locus, even taking into account all the interactions. Okay, so now we at least understand what's what's going on in the alleles. Okay, what does this get us? So let's continue with the uh, investment metaphor. <coughs> Bear with me, we're almost at, uh, at the end here, so just a little bit more. Uh, we want to look at this from the algorithmic perspective. Right? And we'll do this with a story. There's a wealthy individual who wants to invest his wealth. He doesn't know how to do it. He gets experts together. Right? But he doesn't know which expert is best. There's no way to tell ahead of time who's a charlatan who just claims to be a good expert and who really is an expert who knows how to make that money grow for a wealthy individual. Okay, so what he does is, is that he gives a third of his money to each expert. He gives a third to the monkey, and a third to the baby, and a third to the machine. Right? These are the experts he's lined up. And initially he doesn't know who's better off, so he just, you know, divides it equally amongst them. Um, and at the end of the year, he asks each of the experts to come and present to him the portfolio growths that they, each of them gave to him. So let's say that uh, the monkey comes off and says, look, I got you 60% growth, which is great. And the baby enters the room and you know, it's only 40%. Okay, he's a baby. He has something to learn. Uh, and then the stupid machine, of course, what does the machine know? Gave, uh, gave him only 20% return. So our wealthy individual takes a look at this and he says, you know, well, I should have given more of my money to the monkey. I would have been better off, wouldn't I? and less to the machine, given the returns. Okay. So in the next period, he gives more to the monkey, gives a little bit less to the baby, and gives a lot less to the machine here. 
um, because he figures that given the rates of returns that each of the experts gave, he's better off giving more to the expert that did better off in the last period. Okay? So, experts, experts who did better than average are rewarded by having more of the wealth. Experts who are below average get less of the wealth. Maybe you see a theme here, you know, better than average, right? worse than average. Um, and repeat, just like in a replicator equation. Right? So, and this repeats every year. Every year the experts come, they show their portfolio returns to our investor, and the investor changes the fractions of wealth he gives to each of them based on the returns that they brought. <coughs> Okay, this is called the expert's advice problem. And it has been studied in the machine learning community. Right? It's a, an interesting problem, right? You don't know who's the best expert. It's a machine learning problem because you don't know ahead of time which one. What you want to do is you want to learn over time who is the best expert without having that pre-programmed because there's no way to tell. Right? Maybe nobody knows. Right? The portfolio returns might depend on completely unpredictable market conditions. <coughs> So you want an algorithm that learns who is the best expert and achieves that expert's performance. Okay, so the algorithm of giving more to those who did better than average, less to those who are below average, is a special case of what's called the no regrets algorithm. Right? Remember the title of this? Sex with no regrets? That's, that's where it comes from. <laughs> okay? Right? Because basically what happens is, you look at what the experts did, and you say, oh, I regret not giving more to the guy who did better or better than, you know, why did I give so much to the guy who did badly, I could have given more to the guy who did better than that. That's the regret, that's the whole idea, right? So, let's say this psi st, this is the cumulative growth rate from time one to time t of the wealth, as it was when you divided it amongst the experts over time. And this, this is the cumulative growth rate that you would have attained had you given all the wealth from the start to the very best expert. Okay? So this is what you could have done if you had known ahead of time who's the best expert, and this is what you actually did following this algorithm. Okay? So we want to compare that. So the regret at time t is exactly the difference. It's what you could have had versus what you do have because you followed this algorithm rather than giving everything to the best expert ahead of time. Right? But again, I remind you, you don't know ahead of time who's the best expert. Right? So it turns out that if you follow the no regret algorithm, your regret, your average regret, that is, as time goes on to infinity, goes to zero. So you actually end up regretting less and less, on average, as time goes on. And you end up doing just about as well as you would have done had you known ahead of time who's the best expert. Like you lost some... There's a little bit, but as you go to infinity, that fraction you is... Lost uh, what? You lost, time. you lost a little time, you lost a little bit at the beginning, but as you go to infinity, uh, and, and the cumulative numbers rise up, that, that amount of loss is very small compared to... But the environment numbers. changes, so infinity, like... Well, so the environment change, so it's going to infinity. The environment changes. In fact, this algorithm works even when the environment changes. It's a very powerful algorithm. It depends on how fast. It is like a uh, tracking problem. Yeah, it, it, it might converge less quickly, but it actually does very well, even when the environment is changing. So even if the, the best expert yesterday is not the best expert today, this algorithm will still get you But you should to say that the proportion is getting more homogeneous. Not necessarily. Because um, if the environment is changing, then the fractions of the alleles might be changing with that. You still got some of those other less good alleles, the ones who were less good in the past, they're still around in the population. If the environment changes, suddenly they can surge up. So you, you don't lose that much. Yes? Um, does it converge, uh, assuming the environment doesn't change, uh, does it converge to giving all the money to an expert or to some kind of uh, waiting, uh, a wait for each one? Um, I think it could also converge to, to a wait. Uh, these, these things uh, could, there could be all sorts of things that happen along the way. Um, the main point I want to say here is that the no regret algorithm reliably always learns, in hindsight, where it should have put the money. Okay? So, no regrets, you just want it to learn. That's the whole point here. Um, and so, now, by the way, this is not just theory. These learning algorithms are implemented in industries. 
Okay, about two months ago, I was at a conference in Paris. Um, there were representatives of telecommunications companies. Right? These are the companies that decide which packets are flowing through all our uh, lines and telephones, and, and you know, which um, you know, how to switch between different uh, cells and what have you. And they are using the Norgren algorithm to learn over time how to best allocate things for you. So these things are very, very practical, and they work. How do I yeah. apply it to my sex life? <laughs> uh, maybe next week we're going to have Dr. Ruth come here and answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> in your description, you said that at each stage there's kind of a decision to reinvest more in the expert that does better. Yeah. Is there something, I'm a little confused where that allocating comes from. Is it not just like reinvesting the dividends? Aren't you just like what you get, you put back in for each one? I'm confused no. in evolution who would be like giving more to the thing that does well other than just what comes out. Uh, well, let's divide between the metaphor and the model divide. So in the metaphor, what happens is you, the, the investor, you got all the money that you got from these experts, and now you reallocate it. Yeah. You just simply re, you, know, you give more to this guy and less to that. Okay. What happens in uh, evolutionary biology is that it's the reproductive process itself that does that reallocating, right? Because more survives who had the blue eyes. Then you simply have born the next generation. It's okay. automatic. It's, it's a so the investment, thing. it would be like if they reinvested the dividends. They just got to hold on to what they got. Kind yeah, of, I mean, that kind of the same. Or? Kind of. Right. I mean, what happens in, in evolution is, is the process itself does the reallocation. Yeah. It's built in, but that's why it's a machine learning algorithm. It, it just does it on its own. It doesn't need an intelligence. Right, but the point was that it's built in also in investment because if, even yeah. if you did nothing, the monkey uh, has got more money already. At the end of the yeah. first year, right? Oh, I see what you said. Because then you you wouldn't have to reallocate. Yeah. Right. Maybe. Yes. I need to speak yes. investment next week. Yeah. What's the comparison with today's sexual? Ah, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. Let me finish describing sexual reproduction. Then we'll do asex versus sex head to head. Right? That's coming up. That'll be sort of the the, uh, <laughs> the end of the lecture. All right. So putting it all together now. Um, in sexual reproduction, we've got a no regret algorithm implemented in each locus. That means that we find the optimal and hindsight allele at each separate locus. And we can talk about the optimal in hindsight genotype, right? This is the genotype that's got the optimal in hindsight allele at each location, at each locus. So what sex achieves is it achieves the population growth rate that would have been got if the optimal in hindsight genotype were the only one from the start. Right? That doesn't mean that we end up with this genotype, but we end up with the growth rate that we would have attained had we put all our money, as it were, on that genotype at the beginning uh, and let the process run forward. Okay? So, now we get to sex versus no sex, the head to head that we were asking about. Right? Remember, we said asex is an algorithm, it's a learning algorithm, it learns the optimal genotype within the space of all the genotypes. Sex is an algorithm that's the optimal in hindsight genotype, right? So I've labeled this G star and this GS for sex, and this is G star. So um, sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction might end up with different growth rates. They might end up with different genotypes at the end. And the question is, which does better? Which is better? Off? So it turns out that asex does better. I'm not going to go to all the mathematical proof here, but the genotype that the asexual reproduction sort of optimizes towards has better viability than the one that the sexual population closes in. Okay? So we're back to square one. Oops. What's the advantage of sex? Everything I've told you is true, then it still seems it's better off asexual reproduction. So where's the twist in the story here? More variety. No? It's finite. Okay? The space of all possible genotypes is huge. It's astronomically large. You've got to think of all the different combinations you could have when you've got thousands of loci, of loci right? So even if you have, you know, a thousand loci, locations along the DNA, and only two alleles for each of them, you'd have something like two to the one thousand Possible, possible combination, it's, it's mind-bogglingly large. No. Okay. And in each generation, the population can only be a tiny fraction of that immense space. You can never, which means that you can never grasp the full portfolio. 
We only take the tiny, tiny sum. Okay, so what do we do? We do what humans do in the same situation. We conduct random sampling polling. And that's exactly what is happening in evolution. That is, in sexual reproduction, in finite populations, every generation is a small random sample of that immense genotype space. And the portfolio growth now is an estimator of the portfolio growth that we would have had had we been able to capture all that huge genotype space. But now that we've got a sample, we can only estimate it, just like we do when we you know, ask people, whom do you want to vote for? You know, Donald Trump versus you know, some other candidates. Um, so you, could, you take a sample and you try to estimate what the entire population voting would be doing when it gets to the polls. And that's really what's happening in, uh, in, in evolutionary biology. Right? So the allele dynamic is again regretfully minimization. Now it's using it using estimators. And it turns out that using this estimation and this, through sampling, we end up with the same result as we would have got if we had the full, full population. Right? That is, sampling each generation and running the no regret algorithm gives you the same result as you would have had on average in expectation as if you run the algorithm with the entire space available to you rather than just a small sum. Okay. Again, I'm not going to go into the proofs of this, but that comes out of the model that we constructed. Right? In ASEX, in contrast, there's only one sampling at the beginning. It is until there's a mutation. So it'll you know, take this sample, and that's it. It repeats, because the next generation is just a copy of, of the previous <coughs> one. So we're st stuck in a small corner of genotype space. We've got that small initial sample, and we don't move from there. That's what ASEX does. Right? So the best you can do, right? So the best that ASEX can do is find the optimal one from the initial sample. It'll never find the better one that might be lurking there, right, in the genotype space, because it never forms that combination. It forms, you know, the optimal one. It'll only find the local optimal. It does not find the global optimal. Yes, there a question. So can you say that? ASEX is better in a closed system, like in a simulation, in comparison to a sexual reproduction, which is better in open systems, like, like a biosphere for, for the evolutionary... No, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm <laughs> saying that in situations in which you can only take a small sample of the genotype space, which is just about any situation I can imagine, asexual reproduction will find the optimal one of the initial sample, and that's it. Sexual reproduction will travel through the genotype space and will probably find something that's better off. That's what. That's the whole idea. Yeah, it's like local. So um, the asex will find the local maximum or local minimum. Here it's maximum. Will find the local maximum of that small corner in which it initially finds itself because it doesn't move around. Sexual reproduction which moves around the genotype space each time the samples are different bit of genotype space, will find something that's better off than it would have had, perhaps, if it had focused only on the initial sample. Yes, that question? Yeah, so um, I think you're starting to make a good case that uh, sexual reproduction can, can be better for the population because it experiments with new combinations in each generation. But, but how is it better for the individual? In other words, if I happen to have great genes, am I not better off reproducing asexually while everyone else is busy experimenting with new combinations and it's a okay. very costly, you know? For the individual, it, it, it's not better off. Because anyway, you, you're going to you know, pass, pass away at some point and, and your genes have been mixed up in the offspring, so yeah, for the individual, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Yeah, the, the individual is not a, a player. The players are just the aliens. Now, if you've got a sexual population, head-to-head -head with an asexual population, then the claim here is that the sexual population will grow faster over time than the asexual one. It will take over. And that is what gives it the evolutionary advantage. And that's, you know, the whole thing comes down to, that's the claim to why we see more species, far more species, reproducing sexually than asexual. Because of this. Okay. Why do cells 
asexual. Okay, so it's a good question. So why are there still asexual going around? Um, one answer that we thought of. Why, why are there still? What? Our bodies are made of cells that multiply. Our bodies. The question is about our bodies. Our bodies are just a a, a tool used by the genes. Why aren't our cells multiplying cells in sexual? The cells they they they, they multiply, but that's because you only need them temporarily. You only need that body you've got with those cells for the point of having lost them. Right? And then at a certain point, nature's going to toss that away in a bit anyway. So. It doesn't matter, yeah. Uh, also, uh, even the asexual Different species? Uh, okay, so, right, huh? there is something called horizontal gene transfer. So, even the asexual species we know, bacteria, and like, they do exchange, so they've got their own form of sex. That, that also happens, bacterial cell. Um, so it's much less frequent than it in sexual populations. So, that's true, that could, you know, might be a reason that the bacteria who came up with that sort of mechanism for it. Exchanging genes did better off than the ones that didn't, and that's why we see it. Here. It's a good point. So, yes, yeah. What about sort of like uh, why not uh, like uh, three sexes? Oh, it's also a good question. Okay. okay. Yeah. Why two sexes and not three sexes? For I don't know. It's an excellent question. Anyone wants to research that? It's a big open question. <laughs> Even the question of why sexes? Why have male and female? Yeah. Right? You could imagine. That's a separate question. Right? You could imagine a population which we all have aphrodites. We still reproduce sexually, but each of us has both the male and the, se and the female sexual organs. And in fact, a population should theoretically be better off doing that. Because there's actually an idea in the, the uh, biology literature called the cost of males. Males are considered costly to have um, because they haven't got wombs and they don't produce offspring. So it's a burden to have to have males, it's expensive. You've got to, you know, you must feed them and keep them alive. Yeah, we were sitting around with brainstorming ideas. Um, first of all, the idea of the investment metaphor came to us um, because one of us mentioned risk, you know, so you've got risks that are involved in reproduction. And then we thought, well, where do we see risks? Well, people take risks when they're investing in the stock market, and you know, somehow it all went from there. Um, and in terms of the sampling, um, again, we were just having a brainstorming session, and we noticed that in all the equations that we've been using, we'd assumed we had the full genotype space. Um, in fact, if you look at a lot of papers in, in evolutionary biology, they use infinite populations. They literally write an infinite population model. Um, and then it struck us that that's not very realistic. Uh, and once that idea came to the rest of the world, wrong reason. And then we had to do all the maths to, to show that even if you're sampling and you use an estimator, you're still going to get the same results. That took a lot of work. But once we got that, it, it, really, it really all... Uh, well, Flo, look, uh, let's continue. There's not very many slides. We're really nearly at the end here. Okay, so what sex does, in contrast to asex, is that it'll always get to the optimal hindsight genotype, no matter where it starts out in the initial sampling. It moves around the space of the genotypes. It learns that it goes along. It does this very reliable, reliably. And it does this because of the random sampling. So in other words, the randomness of sexual reproduction, which at the beginning of my lecture looked like it was a bug. You know, why go through all this randomness? It's not a bug, it's a feature. Okay? It's part of the, uh, of the learning algorithm. It's a very important part of the learning algorithm. Um, right, it's part of the sampling. Okay, so sex in finite populations okay, is a, is a goal-directed algorithmic exploration to walk through genotypes based by random sampling in each generation with the intention of achieving the asymptotic growth of the optimal hindsight genotype. That's what Sex is. We get down to it. Down to the essence. Okay. For those who might know the what's called the exploration versus exploitation 
uh, dichotomy. Okay? So, in exploration, you want to move around, learn more about the system. But as you're exploring, you're not exploiting what you've got in hand because you're moving around. You're not making the most of what you already have in hand. In exploitation, you make the most of what you already know. You don't take risks trying to learn something new. You just make use of what you've got already. So such asexual reproduction is all about the exploitation. Very little exploration, some with mutations, but it really, it's what it's got in hand, it exploits to the fourth extent. Sexual reproduction emphasizes the exploration part. Right? Less exploitation, more exploration, and that's why it so easily breaks apart successful genetic combinations. Okay? So, if conditions are such that the uh, small random samples will yield local optimum that are below the optimum hindsight genotype growth rate, then sexual reproduction will win in the long run, and in that case, the exploration pays off. The sexual populations will race ahead, um, and the asexuals, the poor asexuals, need to wait for a beneficial mutation, while the sexuals, in each generation, are already moving forward and trying to optimize. Okay? So here in one picture, I give you the, the whole idea, right? Let's say this is all a big genotype space, and let's say this is our little sampling at the beginning. So, asexual reproduction will find the local optimum, which I you know, put here in red, but it never moves out of that small part of genotype space. Sexual reproduction will travel through genotype space until it gets this optimal sexual genotype. Right? And it doesn't matter where we start the initial sampling. Asex will find the local optimum. Sex will move around until it gets the optimal sexual genotype. Right? That might be not the global optimal. It might not get to the best one possible in all the space, but it reliably always gets to a pretty good one. It's good enough. And it's good enough, often enough, to beat the asexual reproduction and get to something that's, that's good enough. Um, now, we tested this. We actually ran computer simulations, head-to-head, -head, sexual reproduction, right? And we used 200, 1,200 locus genotypes. It doesn't really matter so much the details. What we did is basically we sampled out of you know, this large genotype space, five genotypes. That was a, the initial sample. And we had two populations, one reproduced asexually with those genotypes, and one reproduced sexually, again, starting off the same genotypes, and we compared to see what happened over time. Who won the race, essentially? Okay? Um, we used different sort of rules for how the genes interact, but the main point comes out in this graph here. Okay? The blue is the sexual population, the red is the asexual population. We conducted a thousand trials, several times, so it's like so 3,000, 4,000 trials, sex won between 71% of the time and 92% of the time in our simulations. Okay? So running on computer simulations also sort of strengthened our conviction that what's happening when we look at reproduction through sampling in the genotype space, sex has a very, very large advantage over asex. Okay? Uh, yeah. So then you can ask the other way around. If it does, so how come the, like, nature many, many form of life that they was after? Actually, there's not that much. It's something like 96 or 97 percent of all the species on Earth reproduce sexually, believe it or not. Right? But, but uh, you need also to see how many. I think that the, the one that uh, are, um, are sex are much more spread. Okay, they, they are very successful. Um, one possible answer we've come up with is the size of your genome. Okay? So it turns out that the ones who reproduce asexually have a small number, relatively small number of loci in their genomes. Once you get past, I think, about 5,000 loci, at that point, just about everyone reproduces sexually. And you're below that number, just about everyone reproduces asexually. So there's some cutoff. It has, apparently has something to do with the number of loci. We've tried to answer that question. I don't know if we've come up with quite the, the most satisfactory explanation, but apparently it has something to do with the size of your genome, as to how, whether you reproduce this way or that way. And there's some advantage that kicks in once you get beyond 5,000 loci, at least empirically. Yes? Please. So, so would that be related to, like, so in... Like when you have asexual reproduction, you're still moving through the genotype space. You're just doing it more slowly because you're only moving with mutations. Correct. So, like, per, by percentage, your genotype space is much, so much smaller, 35,000, and you're still moving maybe comparatively fast just by mutation and test. 
that, that's one possibility. Yeah. We, we've considered that possibility. We haven't checked the numbers yet. Sounds like a reasonable explanation. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's really cool how you let's just like frame this thing. It's like exploration, exploitation framework. But sort of in the same sense, like if you have like mutations in the asexual one, you can also have some kind of like exploration, right? Definitely. So like is it understood at all like sort of with what mutation probability, like perhaps an asexual like algorithm can beat the sexual algorithm? Or is that I, I, I suppose it could. What we're looking here is, is you know is how often one does better than the other. Um, now Exploration through mutation, which is you know what the asexuals do, is also a good way of exploring, but it's just much slower. So you get a beneficial mutation once every I don't know how many hundreds of generations, let's say. Whereas with sexual reproduction, you're exploring a different part of the genotype space in each di generation. So it's a much faster sort of process. And that that apparently is what gives the sexuals the advantage, that they explore much faster. They also use mutations, right? There's also mutation in the sexual population, so they've got the mutations to help them explore, and they've got the you know, random shuffling that also helps them explore the genotype space. That gives them an advantage. There's a question in the back there. Um, given, given everything you said here about the asexual and sexual, doesn't it seem that, I mean, I think you generalize the only thing is one degree, sexual is better, but Hybrid algorithm seems like it might even be better. Like, if an organism senses that it's close to fit, then maybe it should uh, reproduce asexually. I mean, does that exist? Or it should yeah. be either? Uh, it does. There are there are some examples of that. Well, why, why does it exist more? It's a, it's a very good question. Look, uh, you could think of all sorts of algorithms that will do better than what nature does. Of course, we, we could conceivably we'll do that. Um, there are a lot of open questions. Why? You know, why, why the two sexes? Why, you know, yeah, why this? Yeah, why this? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. There's, there's, there's a lot more to research. So anyone who's looking for a research project, you know, go ahead. <laughs> I've only tried to give one small explanation for one small problem. Maybe in the meantime, that um, organism might good at deciding if they were optimal <laughs> for, for play, right? It could also be a matter of simplicity. Well, ones, uh, did that. It comes from a matter of simplicity. You, you want your machine learning al algorithm to be simple and reliable. So maybe if it's too complicated, if it something switches to that, something switches to that, you might, I don't know, I'm just tossing out speculative ideas. Um, so just two or three more slides and we'll be done here. I just wanted to show you, uh, because I really got a kick out of this. Um, these are, um, the reds are this, the sexual population, the asexual one. The blues are the sexual population. And this is the, the average fitness as we go through forward in time, right, as we go through the generations. So, you can see, initially, the asexuals, they very rapidly rise up to their plateau and they stay there. But they do a very good job of getting up there. The sexuals, they're just moving around, they're exploring the genotype space. They don't know what's going on until suddenly they hit some point, and it seems to happen in every single time we run this, where they suddenly discover that they can learn, and they start learning. And they start climbing up and up and up and up, and they're climbing up until they overtake the asexual population in average fitness. Um, and we've seen this again and again, under you know, very different um, situations, completely random environments and initial samples, and it seems to happen again and again. So th there's something going on here. Is the slope steady? I mean, that's curious. The slope? Uh, it's like it, constant. It, it, it almost looks constant, yeah. Uh, we, we were surprised and flabbergasted by some of the things that came out of the, uh, the, the simulation we ran. All sorts of things that we didn't have in our model, and we probably should in the future, suddenly emerged here. And this, there's a lot of room for, for studying this. Um, so what's the time frame here? I can't read it. It's uh, this is uh, 20 generations, 40 generations, 60, 80, 100, 120, and so forth and so on. For some reason, it seems that around the 100th generation or 90th, for some reason, that's when the sexual reproduction learning curve suddenly hits, hits this kink and starts taking off. So we don't just say it's human race right now. We're like 50 <laughs> 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 If we could split, could split the, the, the population, human population in half, half of them would reproduce asexually, half of them would reproduce sexually. You can choose, I guess, which one you prefer. Which team is right. Um, and running head to head, then we might see something like this, but this is you know, just 
a simulation in the computer. I don't think you could learn anything directly from this at all about the human population. Um, uh, actually, if you have a choice to make with someone that looks a bit like you, or you know, someone that is different in a way, it's like you take the good things to wear, uh, to wear. Like, like, like in a way you preserve what you want, you preserve what you want. G genes are... It could be, but um, you're getting into issues of associated mating methods that are not the model. No. Again, there's also the things not good, not good to do this. Right? So now we can even give you a sort of a movie, it's a dynam dynamic view of, of uh, the simulation. <laughs> So this is the asexual population, and this is the sexual population. So you can see the asexual one very quickly homes in on this, the best that it can do. The asexual one is moving around, moving around, and it slowly closes in on a very normal sort of curve as it's, as it's learning. And that also surprises. You can actually see it sort of, it's very messy at the beginning, and then it sort of closes in on this normal distribution of... Uh, of viabilities, and we don't know why that, that, came, that came about either. So that, that also surprises us, and we haven't worked out the mathematics of that yet. Um, you, you, you can see it even better in the next slide if we mm -hmm. get to it. Number two, right? So yeah. here you can see the asexuals, they quickly <laughs> plateau and they get to their level. And this is the, the sexuals, they're still running around, they're still trying all sorts of things. They're around the 50% mark. And then they start running. Now you can actually see, it looks like this normal curve is sliding along. It's moving along very, very slowly, sort of like a snail. Um, but if you're sharp enough, you can actually see it moving to the right. Is there any stasis in this model? Yes, yes, these are, these are models with epistatis. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any point of running. Um, we have different rules for epistasis. Maybe the distribution. It could be, but there's just uh, some amazing things going on here that I just wanted to show you because I don't. So excited, we only saw this in the past month running the, the simulations. Um, and that brings us uh, really to the end. Uh, and us, so humans, so we reproduce sexually, in case anyone didn't know that. <laughs> uh, and that means we all participate in this multi generational machine learning algorithm. It's called sexual reproduction. Each one of us is unique, and each one of us is really uh, an element of this random sampling. Um, and we're a unique data point that's being used as input by this algorithm, and that's the role <coughs> that we're playing in this huge multi-generational drama, as it were. Um, so that's what we've got, and let's make the best of it. And, uh, and enjoy.